similar to other financial regulators to develop broader capital standards and to charter new enterprises. These common sense proposals that other financial regulators have these powers need not wait for broader reform. In far too many areas of our nation, we face an affordable housing crisis. Too often, this has been the result of misguided local land use and building regulations. In other areas, housing supply remains constrained to a lack of construction labor. For the enterprises to play an important role in addressing this crisis, they themselves must be fixed. Adding more weight to an already cracked foundation is to invite collapse. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Director Calabria. <clears throat> Uh, my first question is to all three of you, and uh, if, this could be a yes or no answer, but feel free to elaborate if you'd like to clarify. Do you all agree that Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac are systemically important companies, that they continue to be too big to fail, and are even more leveraged now than they were before the financial crisis? Secretary Mnuchin. Yes, in their current form, I do. I would agree as so well. Uh, yes, in their current form. All right, thank you. <clears throat> I think I heard you each say this, but I want to ask it again. Do you each agree that the ideal outcome is for Congress to reach a comprehensive solution? I absolutely support that. I think that would be the best permanent outcome. I, I would emphasize that I believe only Congress can reach a comprehensive solution. So by saying that, uh, Director Calabria, that doesn't mean that the administration and the appropriate regulatory agencies can't make significant steps. Absolutely correct. correct. And that leads to my next question, and that is, as we uh, work to, to get a solution here in Congress, um, do you also agree that it's time for the administration to act and to start building the foundation and taking the necessary steps that it can take in order to address this issue and actually help Congress get to a comprehensive solution? We absolutely feel it's our responsibility to work both tracks, but our priority is to work with Congress on a bipartisan basis, and we will do everything we can to achieve that. Thank you, Secretary Carson. And I think, you know, housing is obviously very important to everybody across any political spectrum. And anything that we do is going to be questioned as biased. So, yes, working with Congress is going to be the best way to do it. Uh, absolutely, Mr. Chairman. I, I think that the administration should, should move forward. I should move forward. I, I will tell you, as a safety and soundness regulator, when I look at a $3 trillion institution that has leveraged 1,000 to 1, it keeps me up at night. So my focus is fixing that. Well, thank you. And I'll answer that same question back to you. Uh, I also believe that, that uh, while it's the proper role for Congress to solve this and that only Congress can give the comprehensive solution that is needed, there are significant reforms that can be accomplished and can help actually move us in the direction of the reform that I've outlined in my outline and that I believe we need to achieve here in Congress. And, uh, and I encourage you to act and to, to help us to get to that point. Uh, in that context, and uh, this question really is probably more specifically to uh, Treasury and HUD, uh, I'd like you to talk a little bit about what the next steps that can be taken should be. And in that, again, in that context, uh, it seems to me that a couple of the important ones that I've identified in your reports and in the discussion are capital and amending the PSPAs. But whatever your, your answer to the question is, what do you believe we should start seeing uh, prompt action on? So our, our priority is to make sure that the GSEs have more capital. Uh, we are in active discussions with the director and the FHFA about renegotiating our agreements with them, which would uh, allow for removing the net worth sweeps so that we would allow a significant amount of capital be accumulated, but in return for that, make sure that the taxpayers are compensated for the ongoing Treasury support. And that is something that the director and I uh, hope to achieve very quickly. Secretary Carson. I think uh, the most important things are obviously refocusing uh, Jenny May and FHA on our primary mission, which is providing the opportunities for uh, capital uh, and credit to be extended to non-traditional markets. Also, uh, providing the tools to these two entities that are necessary to deal with the various risks associated with management. 
uh, providing liquidity to the world's largest financial market and protecting the taxpayers. That's really what a lot of this is all about and what happened the last time around should never be allowed to happen again. Thank you. And in my last 30 seconds, I didn't mean to leave you out, Director. <laughs> You've got a, a major role here. But, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, absolutely, my primary focus at first is going to be trying to build capital, but also trying to make sure that FHFA as an agency is ready for a post-conservatorship world uh, in terms of our supervision function, in terms of the powers we have, and in the terms of powers we may ask you that we may need. All right, thank you. I made it with 10 seconds to go, Senator Brown. I probably won't, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> thank you. Uh, Secretary Mnuchin, Secretary Carson, um, presidential memorandum that directed your agencies to complete the plans we discussed today said those plans were, be sub would, were to be submitted to the president for his approval. Uh, question to the two of you, has the president approved your plan? Secretary? We, ha we have briefed the president and he has accepted the plans. He has approved it. Well, I, I believe he's, he's accepted, approved. Let me ask the question. Has he approved the plan, yes or no? Uh, I don't know if he explicitly approved the plan. We'll get back that to you. Secretary we Carson. We, we, we briefed the president, and he accepted the plans. So you handed it to him, and he said, thank you for the plan. Okay. No, now we handed Carson. it to him. We briefed him. Okay. The secretary and I went through and extensively briefed him. Okay, okay, I get it. Secretary plans. Carson? Uh, I agree. Okay. So is it possible he didn't improve the plan because – he and his in-depth knowledge of finance and all things government knows they'll make mortgages more expensive and harder to get, perhaps. I, I just, you know, if the GSEs and FHA cut out their most profitable lines of business and still have to cover their cost, they'll have to raise rates on the borrowers who are left. I mean, that's, that's clear. It seems to me that you can't come here and say the president approved the plan, even though he wanted the, the whole process was be so, would be so that he approved it because the whole argument comes down to trust Wall Street. Just trust Wall Street doesn't really work these days, we should know. Let me, um, Secretary Mnuchin, um, the majority of new households formed between now and 2030 uh, will be headed by people of color. We already have a 30-point gap, 30-point gap in home ownership between uh, black and white households, a 25-plus percent gap between Hispanic and non-Hispanic white households. Uh, this isn't mentioned in either of these plans. Um, in your press release, you said the Treasury Department met with a wide range, met with a wide range of stakeholders, including affordable housing advocates, unquote. How does your plan reflect the priority of civil rights, civil rights organizations and the need for affordable housing and community development and credit access for people of color? Well, let me first just comment. We disagree that this is going to raise mortgage rates and that we will be very do. clear that we are very careful, we support the 30-year mortgage, and we're not going to do anything to jeopardize that for hardworking Americans. Also, we very much support the duty to serve as well as affordable housing goals, and we look forward to looking with There's you. not a lot of evidence the that you chairman. support those. Well, I, I believe we do. Matter of fact, we specifically say in the report, okay, that we believe in affordable housing, but we think that they should be replaced with something that has more efficient, transparent, and accountable. We want to make sure that affordable housing goals are met and that the money is being used carefully. And, and I look forward to working with you. So if you have ideas how we can do this in a better way, we look forward to well, working we do. with there you was consensus. the chairman. There was consensus, as I laid out my opening statement, and your staff, I don't know how much of this you read, but your staff certainly saw this watched or at least as informed of those hearings where there was consensus between among uh, almost the entire panels in the whole industry that we could do these things and you pretty much ignored that in this um so but go back to this question what, what why no mention of people of color in this gap i think we've referenced the duty to serve that's a very important issue that you you've outlined and this is something that we look forward to working with you on i would say our priority is to make sure we maintain affordable housing and duty to serve, but also to make sure that the taxpayers are not at continued risk and we don't have another bailout of these entities. Uh, Secretary Mnuchin, your plan calls for shrinking Fannie and Freddie's role in the housing market, cutting back on their activities, opening up their underwriting systems for anyone else to use, giving away their data, giving price advantages to their new competitors. You also say the GSEs, all three of you said GSEs need more capital and suggest raising capital through an initial off public offering or an IPO. 
Um, you grew up in the you grew up in the private investor world. You um, in the Wall Street world. Um, you are a you were a private investor. Would you invest in GE, GSEs under the Trump administration's plan to shrink them and give away their assets? I would. And you think you you to raise the capital you say they need, you'd have to raise more money than any company in IPO history. Right after the Trump administration has shrunk their businesses and given away their most valuable assets in your sort of cream skimming um, privatization scheme that we've seen in other parts of their government, um, it, it just strikes me as highly, highly unlikely that they can raise that kind of, they can have that successful an IPO, that kind of money, considering what you've done. And Mr. Mr. Chairman, before I close, I'd like to enter in the record a letter from 22 civil rights and affordable housing organizations outlining their principles for reform, um, a letter from eight civil rights organizations, the Urban League, the NACP, Unidos USA, uh, Center for Responsible Lending, National Fair Housing Alliance, National Community Reinvestment Coalition, uh, National uh, Cap Capacity and the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights. These letters outlines why these civil rights leaders, what they see as the essential elements of a sustainable, equitable housing finance system. Few of these, re few of these priorities, as we've seen from Secretary Mnuchin's answers or non-answers, few of them appear in the President's housing plan. Without objection, Senator Toomey. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you to our witnesses. Mr. Chairman, first of all, thanks for kind of launching this conversation with your thoughts recently about how to move forward on GSC reform. I think what the Treasury report has laid out is a very, very constructive set of ideas that we ought to uh, consider very seriously. And I want to thank uh, all of our witnesses for contributing to that. Um, let me start by saying it's clear to me that it's a lack of housing stock more than a lack of subsidies that's the primary cause of an affordability problem, which is a real problem. Mm -hmm. But it's a government-inflicted problem. Now, typically it's state and local, but housing is not immune to laws of physics or laws of economics. If there's not sufficient supply to meet the existing demand, then it becomes more expensive, and vice versa. And I never cease to be amazed by the jurisdictions with the most severe affordability problems and the things they do to exacerbate the problems, like San Francisco blocking an affordable housing development because it casts a shadow on a park. Okay, that's gonna make affordable housing more expensive. Or, or California as a whole requiring that all new houses have to have solar panels installed, thereby raising the cost of houses. And rent control, which clearly and obviously exacerbates housing shortages where it's imposed. So, first of all, I wanna thank Dr. Carson, for the important work that you've been doing in identifying impediments to the delivery of new affordable housing stock. And I guess I'd like to direct to Dr. Calabria, if there are things that we can be doing in the reform, acknowledging that I think most of these obstacles occur at the state and local level, are there things we can do to go to the fundamental underlying problem, which is inadequate supply? First, let me say I couldn't agree with you more strongly that the fundamental problem is inadequate supply and the primary driver of that is state local regulations uh, and it really does concern me the damage that's being done to our economy and to affordability and access from these barriers and this truly is causing affordable housing crisis in many parts of this country uh, and so we have to recognize that while uh, the mortgage market and mortgage finance does play a role it cannot fix this problem by itself uh, I think the extent that we can encourage and work with localities, and, and again, I would applaud as well Secretary Carson's effort in this regard to try to bring some focus uh, on trying to reform local land use uh, and regulation. Um, so, so, as I understand, the Treasury report acknowledges that there uh, is a statutory role to support um, affordability. But as I, as I read it, the report identifies a flaw in the mechanism that the GSEs use. And as I, as I think about it, it seems to me that our GSEs use an indirect subsidy. In other words, the subsidy doesn't go directly to people who have a low income. The subsidy tends to go to high credit risk loans. And you might think that high credit risk is a good proxy for low income, but it's really not, right? A, a very wealthy person can have an extraordinarily high risk loan Absolutely. And a person of very modest means could have a very prudent and low-risk loan. So 
Isn't it true that we could de design the subsidy in a more transparent, clear, and efficient fashion that if we're going to provide a subsidy, it's actually targeting low-income folks rather than sort of distorting and arguably encouraging more high-risk transaction? And, and that's, that's really for Dr. Calabria as well as Secretary Mnuchin. Let, let me say, I absolutely agree. A handful of studies have looked at this question, and while the correlation between income and credit is positive, it is weak. And so you were right, there are plenty of uh, high-income people who have poor credit and plenty of low-income people who have good credit. So I absolutely do believe we can better target the resources we have in a more efficient manner uh, to try to get people in homeownership who wouldn't be other there otherwise and get them in sustainable homeownership. And Secretary Mnuchin, it seemed like you were alluding to this dynamic uh, a moment ago. Is there anything you want to add to that? Yes, Senator Jimmy, I, I agree with you completely. Uh, first, we absolutely support wanting to make sure there is affordable housing, but we want to do it in the most effective way. And I think we'd all agree that the previous system did not work, and that's part of the reason why the GSEs got into trouble. So I would hope that this committee will work with us on a bipartisan basis to figure out what's the best way to deliver this support in affordable housing. Thanks very much. I don't have enough time to get into my next line of question, Mr. Chairman, so I'll yield my last 13 seconds. Senator Menendez. Thank you. Uh, thank you uh, to our witnesses. I'd like to start with an important issue for New Jersey and many other communities represented by members on both sides of the committee. As part of your plan, Treasury is recommending that FHFA solicit information on whether to tailor support for higher principal balance loans, which any reasonable person would interpret to mean that Treasury is seeking to lower conforming loan limits. Doing so would have a seriously negative impact on the housing markets in states like New Jersey. So, Secretary Mnuchin, why would you recommend that the FHFA, quote, solicit information on whether the FHFA should effectively lower conforming loan limits if Director Calabria asserts that the FHFA does not have the authority to administratively change conforming loan limits? Congress has the responsibility on loan limits, having, and any changes would require Congress. Having said that, we always think it's important to solicit information on, on the markets, and specifically in New Jersey. We don't, we don't want to do anything to jeopardize the housing markets in New Jersey, and I completely understand in the tri-state area the cost of living is significantly higher. Yeah, it's not just the tri-state area. There are many places in the country in which there the are many, but I was just referring to New Jersey yeah, and the places I, I, around. It's, it. For me, it's not just simply it is an important local issue, but it's not a parochial issue alone. So you do agree then, as Director Calabria said in his testimony uh, in his nomination hearing, that he does not have the authority to administratively change uh, those conforming loan limits. I'm going to defer to him on his legal analysis, but I, I think our legal analysis is your, that's Congress's legal responsibility. Analysis, Director Calabria is still the same as when you testified in your conference? Uh, yes, Senator. Thank you very much. So we've established that. Now let me turn to uh, the multifamily rental housing, which is a critical part of the housing market in New Jersey and across the country. More than uh, 18 million households in the United States live in multifamily rental housing including a million New Jerseyans. The GSCs play a vital role by ensuring that multifamily housing is widely available through the economic cycle. As you know, the multifamily businesses at Freddie and Fannie perform quite well and remain profitable during the worst of the financial crisis, a time in which we saw most private investors exit this segment of the market entirely. Secretary Mnuchin, the Treasury report recommends that Treasury and FHFA should consider limiting support of the GSE's multifamily business. We heard from witnesses before this very same committee in the multifamily industry in March that private capital alone cannot fill the void that would be left without GSC financing. And that would mean aggravating the housing crisis that already exists in states like New Jersey and across the country, leaving renters with fewer and more expensive housing options. Have you conducted any analysis on what private sector financing for the multifamily housing market would look like if the GSE's capacity to purchase multifamily loans is curtailed as described by your plan? 
Well, I'm not sure we necessarily think it's curtailed. I think we just need to look at it in the risk context. And I know there are external people who thought the GSEs should get out of the multifamily business. I don't agree with that. I think that the GSEs absolutely need to be in the multifamily business. I would say that more broadly, there are issues given the GSEs exposure in multifamilies. There are obviously certain, uh, certain rent control rules and others that have now, I'm concerned, are gonna limit the housing stock. So we absolutely so you, you didn't conduct an analysis here. Let me ask you this other question as a follow-up then. What makes you confident that the private market can fill the void or do you not believe that the private market can fill the void? I'm not saying that the private market can or can't fill the void. What we're going to continue to do more analysis. We're just saying that we want to make sure that the the GSEs have the appropriate risk. So we very much support multifamily lending with the right. GSEs. Finally, uh, Secretary Carson, on a different but urgent matter, uh, in previous cases where lead was found in drinking water systems, federal assistance was critical in helping communities remediate their water systems and reduce potential lead exposure. As I'm sure you know, the city of Newark recently discovered elevated lead levels from some limited water samples. I've already called on the EPA to provide on the ground support and technical assistance, but I believe HUD needs to be part of the solution as well. In 2016, HUD assigned a full-time staff member to assist HUD residents in the greater Flint region and provide technical assistance to city and state agencies. So I want to ask you, Mr. Secretary, as the city of Newark and the surrounding communities continue to address this issue, would you commit that if HUD-assisted properties are affected, you will assign a full-time staff member to assist both HUD residents and city <laughs> and state agencies looking to tailor their CDBG funding to mitigate the risks of lead? Well, thank you, Senator, for your, your interest in this. I, and thank you for the help that you gave us on the carbon monoxide uh, poisoning as well. Um, as you've noted uh, in our budgetary request over the last two to three years, uh, we've placed a great deal of emphasis on lead and on communities that are affected by it. Uh, so I will commit to continuing to do that and continuing to raise the profile of this issue uh, in New Jersey and elsewhere. I appreciate that, but my specific question, Mr. Chairman, and I appreciate your, your uh, indulgence a moment, is would you commit, as we did in Flint, to have a person who is designated for Newark and the surrounding communities that are affected by this to assist them as it relates to the flexibility that has been shown in the past in CDBG funding? Uh, I, I will commit to doing everything that we possibly can do to alleviate the problem there. And if that involves a specific person or a dozen specific people, we will do what is necessary. Right. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Senator Cotton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, gentlemen, for appearing here today. Thank you, Secretary Carson, in particular, for coming down to Arkansas earlier yes. this year. Um, I want to return to an issue that Senator Toomey uh, touched upon, and that's restrictions on supply in housing, and especially local restrictions. It sounded like we had some agreement between Senator Toomey, uh, a well-known uh, conservative mind when it comes to housing and finance policy, and our Republican witnesses. Um, I just want to read from another statement about these restrictions and get your response to them, in particular Secretary Carson and Mr. Calabria. Locally constructed barriers to ho new housing development include beneficial environmental protections or well-intentioned permitting processes or historic preservation rules, but also laws plainly designed to exclude multifamily or affordable housing. Local policies acting as barriers to housing supply include land use restrictions that make developable land much more costly than it is inherently, zoning restrictions, off-street parking requirements, arbitrary or antiquated preservation regulations, residential conversion restrictions, and unnecessarily slow permitting processes. Secretary Carson, does that sound like a pretty good catalog of local restrictions that reduce affordable housing supply? That sounds like a good catalog. And interestingly enough, what we've observed is in areas that have the greatest affordable housing needs and our largest number of homeless people, we have the largest number of restrictions. Uh, you look at a place like San Francisco, the median home price in the San Francisco Bay Area is $1.6 million. And you, you look at Los Angeles with the requirements for solar panering. And a, a lot of this, quite frankly, is uh, because of NIMBYism. You know, not in my backyard. But NIMBYism is actually based on archaic thinking. They believe that the federal government still acts the way that it used to you know, building these gigantic complexes with little forethought, afterthought, or intermediate thought or support. 
uh, and that's not what's done anymore. Now we're talking about public-private partnerships. We're talking about uh, multiple incomes. We're talking about conforming to the uh, architectural and cultural uh, issues in the area. We're not talking about putting a multifamily house or a complex in the middle of single family neighborhood. People have wrong impressions of what we're doing. We actually care about what people think, but it can be done in the right way so that firemen and policemen and nurses can live in the same neighborhood where they work. I think that actually enhances the community. Uh, Mr. Calabria? Uh, it, let me say, you know, I, I very fully agree. And I think part of the problem is, particularly in places like California, the process just has multiple vetoes where people can object and object to construction. And you do need streamlining of that. Uh, that said, I think we should look to cities that have done a good job, as Senator Smith is aware, Minneapolis recently has upzoned, and, and I think done a very smart maneuver move there on a local level that will help affordable housing in that area. So I think there are good lessons to learn as well as some lessons to learn in cities that don't work. Well, that long catalog of local restrictions that uh, retard the supply of affordable housing comes from none other than Barack Obama's White House uh, housing plan in September of 2016. So I hope now that we have agreement between Barack Obama, Mark Calabria, Ben Carson, and Pat Toomey that we could try to address this problem perhaps by looking at ways to condition grants on more affordable housing policies at the local Absolutely. level. Another local policy, of course, is education policy. Uh, anybody who has a child that's been going into school knows the pressure of getting in a good school district. I want to read a few quotes from a well-known book about the stress on middle-class families. In the overwhelming majority of cases, a bureaucrat picks the child's school, not a parent. The way for parents to exercise any choice is to buy a different home, which is exactly how the bidding wars started. The crisis in education if not only, is not only a crisis of reading and arithmetic, it is also a crisis of middle class family economics. At the core of the problem is the time honored rule that where you live dictates where you go to school. Any policy that loosens the ironclad relationship between location, 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 and school, school, school would eliminate the need for parents to pay an inflated price for a home just because it happens to lie within the boundaries of a desirable school district. A well-designed voucher program would fit the bill neatly. Fully funded vouchers would relieve parents from the terrible choice of leaving their kids in a lousy school or bankrupting, bankrupting themselves to escape those schools. If a meaningful public school voucher system were instituted, the U.S. housing market would change forever. Gentlemen, those quotes are from Smith Warren. Senator Warren's book from 2003 in support of a school voucher program. I know that you don't do education policy, but do you agree that local education rules can negatively impact affordable housing prices? Uh, I do, and let me also say uh, her passages in that book on housing subsidies are a delightful read that I would encourage members of the committee to take a look at. I know my time's expired, but perhaps you can find an ally on the other side of the aisle, along with Secretary DeVos, to both improve the quality of education in America and affordable housing. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Tester. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Brown, for being here. And I want to thank all the, the folks who are testifying today. I uh, will tell you at the onset, it's good to have you in front of the committee. I wish we had you in front of the committee more often. Uh, it doesn't happen enough that we have folks from the administration here to visit with us. Dr. Carson, yeah. you're always welcome back in Montana, too. Thank you. Uh, you got a chance to see uh, some rural housing. And I don't want to talk about housing in San Francisco or L.A. or Denver or New York City or Atlanta or Miami or Houston. I want to talk about housing in Miles City, mm -hmm. in Plentywood, in Great Falls, in Billings, in Missoula, in Pablo, in Rocky Boy. Because quite frankly, um, we're talking about large cities and we've got just as big a crisis in rural America, if not worse, and nobody's paying attention to it. So I want to start with, with you, uh, Secretary Mnuchin. When, when, this, when this plan was developed, how, how much effort was put into getting information from rural slash frontier America on affordable housing? Well, first, let me say I, I enjoyed visiting many of those places during the president's campaign. So, uh, yes, you were there. Montana, and even during my campaign. Yeah, I don't know if you were with indeed. him or not, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I, I very much appreciate and support 
there shouldn't be a big city housing plan. There should right. be a housing plan. But but you're impacts. right. But the question is, is how much information did you gather when you developed this plan from rural slash frontier areas? Because, you know, rural is this, the area between Baltimore and Washington, D.C. in some people's eyes. We don't have that kind of population in Montana, even our most populated areas. So how much how much information was gathered from? I, I think we solicited uh, from Variety, but I'm going to get back to you on the specifics. Uh, I would have, but but I assure you, more importantly, I would appreciate. I, I understand the point that you're trying yep. to say, and this should very much help the people in Montana, and not just the people in New well, York and California. It, it's critical, and I, and I will get into that in a second. But but when it comes to regulation of like shadows and solar panels in rent control, those are really good issues for us to talk about here. But Mile City, Montana. The only regulation is you can't build in a floodplain, okay? And we still don't have housing, so that's that's the point. And and in your in your in your uh, in your plan, um, and, and I just want to get an idea. You talked about uh, they need to serve the Garnters need to serve uh, a national market, but then it's also suggested that Congress should not. Uh, require guarantors to serve a national plan, but in individual markets. Where, where are you on that? And, and, and I assume what you're saying is that you want to have a rule that supports national service, but Congress should undermine that and make it individual markets. No, no, that's not the case. We, Tell me what it says. We, 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 su we support the, the, the national concept, uh, yeah. right? but we're looking at that and saying, it can't just be a national plan. It also has to have specific plans, as you said, that impact places like Montana and make sure that they're not left behind. So the intent was to promote more access for rural frontier yes. areas. Yes. Could it, could it be used to do exactly the opposite, though? Well, that, that's not our intent. And, and as I said, our priority is to work with Congress so that there's clarity in these issues. We want to make sure whether it's this director I, I or just, any other future director I just want to make, make sure, though, Secretary Mnuchin, that you're, you're saying the right things right now. But the, the truth is, if, if, you, if you have uh, a national plan and, and then it can be undermined to serve just individual markets, it looks to me like it would actually money would flow to uh, the bigger areas where there's no that, that, That's not our intent. And again, working with Congress, we will refine okay. and define these issues. Okay. So let me talk about the 30-year fixed rate mortgage for a second, because uh, in the report, uh, it ultimately suggests maintaining the 30-year fixed rate mortgage, but it also says it's possible that the 30-year fixed rate mortgage loan could remain widely available and at similar prices under a market structure that does not depend on government support. Can you tell me why this line is in there? Oh, I, I think there's, I, I think there's, first of all, again, let me just emphasize, we very much support the 30-year mortgage. Yeah, I got Although it. I will say the 30-year mortgage might not be for everybody, and there are yeah, different products. I, I got it. Sense. But what, what I hear that saying is a 30-year fixed rate mortgage could exist without any government backing. Do you guys believe that? No, we don't. I, I, there could be parts of the 30-year mortgage market, i.e. The, the large jumbo market yeah. that do not need government guarantees and will have a 30-year mortgage. So you would agree without that government backing of 30-year fixed rate mortgage that it would have a pretty negative impact on housing, whether it's regardless? We, we need either an implicit or an explicit government backing, and that's why we'd rather have the taxpayers have an explicit and compensated. Thanks. I used your and Toomey's over, so thank you. <laughs> I noticed. <laughs> thank you. Senator Rounds. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I want to thank uh, you and, uh, and our panelists for their hard work on these proposals. Um, housing finance reform is a difficult issue to tackle, and I appreciate their dedication to ending the decade-long GSE conservatorship. There's something else as well I'd like to just add at this time. There are challenges within housing within the United States and rural areas, as my colleague on the other side of the aisle has just indicated. I'm just going to give an example, and I, I don't know, Secretary Carson, we had a discussion on this the other day. Indian reservations, Native Americans have a real challenge because we have Indian trust lands, and trying to find a way to move forward uh, so that they can also purchase houses is something that is of real importance in South Dakota. Just as an example, the VA, they do VA loans for, for uh, Native Americans who are veterans who now live back on a reservation. 
Minneapolis office uh, about a year ago received uh, recognition because they had the highest number of those mortgages that had been issued in the previous year, five in the entire region. Simply not acceptable. Yeah. There's got to be a way forward. And so as we look at this, I don't think this is a Republican issue or a Democrat issue. I think this is a case of where we have to find a way forward to fix the challenges. Um, I, I, I'd like to say to all of my colleagues uh, on both sides of the aisle that I believe that the door should be open when it comes to working out a pathway forward to ending conservatorship of the GSEs. Chairman Crapo was able to come to a consensus with then Chairman Tim Johnson, who was my predecessor, about how to unwind conservatorship in a bill that passed out of committee on a bipartisan vote. There's no reason that we shouldn't be able to navigate those same concerns today. Today's hearing should also serve as a warning um, as we've all read, the Trump administration is determined to bring the GSE conservatorship to an end, and it has clearly defined ways that it can do so. While my colleagues might object to certain parts of the administration's plan, these objections are no justification for not attempting to at least find a path forward within this committee. There's common ground that could be had, and it is very unfortunate if we are not able to hold uh, a markup on this approach. It's been 500 days since this committee has held a markup. If your concerns are genuine in this committee, if our committee members are serious about doing something, I think this is the time in which we can perhaps find some common ground. Uh, my first question I'd like to direct to Secretary Carson. Mr. Secretary, I note with great interest uh, HUD's proposal to transform the Federal Housing Administration into an independently chartered government corporation. Now, I, I agree with HUD that this would provide FHA with the autonomy it needs to better execute its mission, especially serving first-time and low-income home buyers, while still allowing for HUD to have oversight and regulatory authority. I would like to point, to my co point out to my colleagues on the other side of the aisle that this is not an idea that comes from the radical right. Uh, President Obama's FHA commissioner, Carol Galani, has proposed the same reform. Nonetheless, Mr. Secretary, I have drafted legislation that would do just as you proposed, but some of my colleagues have expressed reservations that reforming the FHA into a government-chartered corporation would impact HUD's funding for other programs. My view is that the receipts from FHA mortgage insurance would still be available to offset the costs of other HUD spending. I've offered to give my colleagues on the other side of the aisle an opportunity to rewrite or to have input into this section of the bill, but so far I have not received any takers. My question is, could you briefly discuss how to achieve a more independent FHA without jeopardizing HUD's funding? Well, oh, thank you for that question. Uh, and I did very much enjoy the uh, time I spent in uh, your estate. Um, interestingly enough, uh, we have not uh, said anything about the receipts uh, all being swept into any particular area. So uh, that uh, obviously is not going to be a particular problem. The reason that we want to separate it out into an individual corporation, uh, very much like Jenny May, uh, is so that uh, they can have the flexibility of doing their own procurement, their own hiring, staffing, being able to respond quickly and with agility to market conditions that occur. They would still uh, report to the HUD secretary and we would still be able to align our missions. So uh, uh, consider the fact that right now the FHA uh, commissioner has to deal with a lot of housing assistance needs also. Those really require their own separate uh, entity uh, so that we can really concentrate on public housing you know, on multifamily uh, in, a, in a way that it should be concentrated on. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My time has expired. I would uh, ask for the opportunity to ask several questions for the record that um, we'll ask you all to respond to. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Warner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And good to see the witnesses. Um, I've spent a lot of time on this subject over the last many, many years. And where I want to focus today, Secretary Mnuchin, is particularly less on what you aspire for legislatively, but what potentially might happen administratively. And I have to say at the outset, I'm a little concerned that it appears to me from your administrative proposals, we could end up with a system that actually doesn't end too big to fail and doesn't 
increase affordable access to credit, and that is a grave concern to me. First of all, I want to associate myself with Senator Menendez, who I think rightfully pointed out that in multifamily, not a problem, wasn't part of the crisis, um, but in the administrative component of your proposal, you're trying to lower the uh, GSC multifamily caps. Um, to me, that means smaller support for multifamily. Uh, I am concerned about that. Uh, it also, in your administrative proposal, so again, let's not talk about legislatively, we continue to see this theme around trying to lower the GSC footprint. If we have a lower G GSC footprint, if we have higher capital requirements, just the logic of that would mean you would have a much smaller revenue base, and under that assumption, wouldn't that mean the GSEs would deliver less cross-subsidy in the system? First, I just want to acknowledge the, the work that you've personally done on legislation, and I, I truly hope that you will work with us because uh, I, I know you spent a lot of time on this and is... Uh, is, is I know more about this subject than I ever wanted to. Uh, I, exactly. <laughs> And we, we hope not to lose all that knowledge. So, uh, you know, again, I just want to, when we comment on multifamilies, uh, the GSEs have gone from 25 to 40 percent of market share, um, which I think is fine. We're not looking to take it back down to 25 percent. We just don't want to see it to go but from administratively, I thought you to said that you wanted to lower the GSE multifamily caps. Uh, again, we, we, we want to take which been, I would read is slowing down. Go to my other question, though, which is if you're lowering smaller, making the footprint smaller, if you're raising capital, which appropriate, um, isn't that going to mean de facto a decrease in the cross subsidies that take place in the system? No, no, not necessarily. How do we do that? Uh, I, I, again, I, I think that uh, it, it, cross subsidy is something that we have. It, as we've talked about it, some of it is efficient, some of it is inefficient. Uh, again, our priority... I'd, I'd like to see some more detail on that. I, I think I, I don't respectfully see how you make that happen. Uh, Dr. Calabria, let me ask you this. If you end up in, on your administrative and in the net worth sweeps, will you continue to fund the Housing Trust Fund? Just give me a yes or no. Uh, as long as the conditions in the statute that require it, yes. So you're going to sweep all the profits try to build up capital, but you're still, you are committing here to continue to fund the Housing Trust Fund. As long as the conditions and statute are met for, for funding it, then yes, absolutely. Well, there's a little, great deal of this discussion about what, what the statute says. Well, agreed, but uh, I'm, I'm bound by what the statute says. Now, my sense is, and Secretary Mnuchin, that, you know, I know you talk about potentially for additional entrants coming into the market, but my concern is on your administrative proposal that you're what you're really talking about on Fannie and Freddie is recap and release, which is going to keep us with a duopoly, even with higher capital standards, which is going to put us right back to where we were um, prior to 2008. I, I don't know how that gets rid of our too big to fail issue. So one of the things you answered, you both addressed when Senator Crapo raised about as currently constituted um, these entities are, are too big to fail. Uh, if you go forward, and this is both for Dr. Calabria and, and Secretary Mnuchin, if you go ahead and go through on your recap and release plan, um, would you both recommend that the GSEs be designated as CIFIs by FSOC? Thank you, I think that's an important question. So first let me just say we do not believe in a simple recap and release. I wanna make that very clear. Second, uh, That's we, not the way I respectfully I read, read your proposal. Okay, we well, that's why I, just, I just said I want, I want to make that very clear. Uh, the second thing I would say is we absolutely would expect, uh, either in the administrative way or working with Congress, that we would go to FSOC and before, before we raised public capital, we would make sure we understood that there was enough capital so that they did not need to be designated. Dr. Clarby, I, I would agree with the Secretary's statement there. So neither one of you think, under your recap and release scheme, that the GSEs will be CIFI designated? Uh, Senator, as a member of FSOC, why I believe that there is more than sufficient information to begin a process, I also think it's important as a member of FSOC to never start with the presumption that any entity is necessary systemic until you've actually run the process. Only thing I would just point out, Mr. Chairman, is that 
when you and the ranking member had, I thought, a very helpful hearing on this, I believe every witness across the ideological spectrum thought that the GSEs should have received that FSOC SIFI designation. And, and again, this concerns me gravely that uh, we could somehow end up with a scheme where we end up with a duopoly. Somehow they're not even going to get SIFI designation. And I believe we're right back in the middle of a too big to fail. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, Senator Warner. Senator Kennedy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Director, um, as an American, do you believe that I have a right to own a home, even if I can't afford it? I, I think you have a right to own property, yes, uh, own a home. Now, whether you can afford it is opens up to whether you can actually buy that home. I mean, it's it's the same in terms of you have the right to, you have the right to drive a Mercedes, whether you can afford it or not. It's a separate question. Right. So I'm not sure where you're going with the question, Senator. It'd be helpful I, I for me to parse want, that out. I want to understand your philosophy. Do you do you do you think that uh, as an American, if I can't afford a home, I have a fundamental right to have other Americans? Uh, uh, Subsidize me. Thank you for the clarification. Uh, the short answer would be no. Okay. But yet, I think everybody on this this committee, I think everybody on this panel, believes we ought to do everything possible to make uh, homes and mortgages affordable. Absolutely. Okay. We can agree on that, right? Absolutely. Hundred percent. Why would a lender make a loan without in, uh, verifying income? Agreed. Why would they? Uh, I think the only reason that a lender would reduce due diligence like verifying income is because they can pass that risk along yeah. to someone else, like the taxpayer. Yeah, because they can, they can sell it to you guys. Absolutely. I mean, isn't that the fundamental problem here? How we got in trouble was, was underwriting standards? Uh, uh, absolutely. Um, we are the ones holding the bag at the end of the day after everybody else in the process has made money and walked away. It is the taxpayer holding the bag. Well, what have you done to fix that? Well, Senator, we've begun, um, I guess, uh, tomorrow we're, Mark, uh, five months in the job. We've already started doing a bunch of due diligence internally, try to make sure that we have the regulatory that scheme. That wasn't a fair question. What, what, did, what did your predecessor do to fix that over 11 years? I, uh, Senator, I, I, I think that, to me, I, I'm looking at what needs to be done going forward. Uh, I Obviously, I would have preferred to inherit a different situation than I did, but... Well, uh, excuse me for interrupting, but, you know, we're limited on time, Mr. Director. Have underwriting standards gotten any, uh, any more realistic? They've gotten worse, not better. Certainly at the GSEs, we saw a massive expansion in the last two years, at least, where a well, whole lot of I, high income, D, high DTI loans were done that weren't previously being done. So underwriting standards have eroded. Yeah, that's what I thought. And it concerns me greatly. Well, he, he, this is just one, one point of view. This whole thing is a car wreck. <laughs> it's a dumpster fire. We spent $190 billion of taxpayer money, and we're in worse shape. Agreed. Now, here's what I think we ought to do. I, I'm not in love with every aspect of your plan, um, but I'd encourage you to get somebody to put it in the form of a bill if you haven't already, get it introduced, and let's mark it up in this committee, Mr. Chairman and Mr. Ranking Member. Let's put, let's put it in front of the committee and let senators be senators, and let's try to put out the dumpster fire. What, what do we have to lose? I, I mean, how long have we been talking about that? Doing nothing is hard. You know why? You never know when you're finished. <laughs> Senator, I couldn't agree more. Now, if that doesn't work, and I'm not going to mislead you, it's going to kind of be like slamming, trying to slam a revolving door, pass a bill through the Senate. I would encourage you, Mr. Director, to saddle up and go. Tell me what you can do with your administrative authority to put out this dumpster fire. Well, the first thing we hope... And by that, I mean encouraging people to make loans to people who clearly can't afford to pay them back. Senator, we will be de-risking the GSEs, particularly in the... What does that mean? 
Uh, that means that on one hand, if you leverage 1,001, you can't make loans that are almost guaranteed to go bad. So we have to be able to improve the quality of the lending that the GSEs in a way that is sustainable, that doesn't end up. I 100% agree. If we do nothing, this is going to end very badly. Well, uh, of and course it is. We're going to have a recession at some point. Absolutely. What was the leverage ratio, Mr. Chairman? 19 cents for every $100? That's what I understand. 1,000 to 1 at Fannie Mae. Now, let me say it again. I got one second left. Let's put this bill in front of this committee, Mr. Chairman and Mr. Ranking Member, and let's see what we can do. I listened to Sharon's comments. He made some good points. I don't agree with all of them, but uh, I think we ought to flesh it out. But if we're not, let's just admit that Congress is just going to sit on its ice cold, lazy butt, do nothing, and you need to get started trying to fix this car wreck, Mr. Director. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Jones. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, the witness. I want to follow up my friend, Senator Kennedy. I absolutely agree with that. Completely agree. We need to get this in front of this committee. We need to get it, and we need to hash it out. But with all due respect to the senator, I think we need to go farther than just this housing issue in this committee. We need to get things to the floor of the United States Senate. We need to talk about gun violence. We need to talk about health care. We need to talk about election security. There's a lot of things that this Congress of the United States and the Senate of the United States need to act as the independent body that the Constitution set up and not just somebody that's there only if the President of the United States is going to uh, uh, sign a bill. So thank you, Senator, and I apologize if I took it a little farther than what you anticipated, but I completely agree with you. Uh, second thing, a quick comment, uh, Secretary Mnuchin, and I will follow this up uh, for the record. I believe that you earlier testified that, and, and I could be wrong, but I thought I heard you testify that the duty to serve um, the very low, low, and moderate income uh, families in this country was maintained in this report. I don't read this that way. I, re I see on page 23 and 24 of the report where you're talking about reforming that, taking rid of that mandate and replacing it with something that would involve assessments and congressional appropriations, which I think is a really slippery slope uh, to try to do as much as I like Senator uh, Leahy and Senator Shelby's approach to appropriations. That may not always be the case and subject to the whim of a Congress or the administration. So I'll follow up uh, with a question for the record. The one area I do want to talk to uh, about uh, with Dr. Carson, um, Mr. Secretary, while I appreciate the administration's efforts to move forward on housing uh, reform, I, I do believe that overall these reforms are going to make it harder uh, for working class families to achieve home ownership uh, and potentially put the dream of home ownership out of reach. My view, open to discussions on that. But more importantly, while these reforms are being discussed today, I think we also have to uh, talk about some other so-called reforms that the administration is making to housing in America. We haven't seen you here for a few months, a uh, year and a half, as a matter of fact. I don't know if we'll get to see you again uh, in any time in the future, so I want to ask you about a recent HUD proposal regarding uh, rules that I believe are going to dramatically undermine the ability to enforce the Fair Housing Act. I have talked time and time again in this committee and others that housing discrimination in 2019 is persistent. Uh, but often, more often than not, subtle, not always direct. And years of legal doctrine, including the Supreme Court, made it clear that if policies and practices of businesses unintentionally discriminate against racial minorities or protected classes, it's illegal. It's called disparate impact. And the new rules, I think, make it nearly impossible to bring forward a discrimination case based on disparate impact. Fair housing is only as fair as it can be enforced, and if we can't bring disparate impact housing by very nature, it ain't fair. And I am concerned about this. Every single major housing rights and civil rights advocate agreed that this rule is a major blow. Across the board, this rule introduces new hurdles uh, before, uh, for plaintiffs, including a new five-part test. Um, Mr. Secretary, I think we can all agree that housing discrimination still exists in this country. Black home ownership rates are down to just 40 percent. That is not just because of uh, discrimination. I, I get that. We've, we're still pulling out of a recession. But the fact is they're down to 40 percent, and black home ownership is actually lower now than it was in 1968 
when the Fair Housing Act was passed. I would also like to point out that you have the ability to um, bring secretary-initiated complaints. President Obama did it an average of 10 times a year. President Bush did it an average of five times a year. But in the two and a half years of the uh, Trump administration, we have zero that you have initiated. So a cynic would say that this new rule is in part to justify the inaction of HUD in bringing these complaints when we know that they exist. So my question to you, sir, my question is simply explain this to me. Explain why we need this rule. What is important? Why do we need this when we know it exists? Uh, give me an opportunity. Give us an opportunity to explain why you are going to make it nearly impossible for people to bring disparate impact statements. Let me just mention the fact that uh, uh, our record uh, stands for itself. The fact of the matter is, you know, we've initiated the uh, Facebook uh, complaint. Uh, we've uh, gotten an agreement out of Los Angeles after almost 10 years of not taking care of disabled people's uh, housing needs. Uh, we've uh, launched one against San Francisco for uh, discriminating against low-income people for housing. And uh, if you look at our list of uh, suits that have been brought, uh, I think they would compare favorably with anyone else. As far as disparate impact is concerned, we are trying to bring it into alignment with the Supreme Court ruling. Uh, for, for oh, come on, Mr. Secretary. I'm a lawyer. I, I, that, that, that dog's just not going to hunt. It's just not. This is not in The Supreme Court barely ruled back this. You're, 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 what you're doing is making, I've, I've been practicing law for 40 years. What you're doing is making it just damn near impossible for a, a plaintiff to bring an desperate, a, a disparate impact statement. It is not in line with the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court's affirmed this time and time again. In fact, in fact we've brought a complaint against San Francisco on disparate impact. You should go back and read it. I'll take a look. I'm, I'm happy about. to do that. But the fact of the matter is, if Congress, for instance, were to raise the... Uh, the, the rate, minimum wage rate to $15, who would be disproportionately affected? Low skill or unskilled workers, primarily minorities in that area. That becomes a disparate impact against Congress. You begin to see what I'm talking about here. No, you can I'm have sorry. a disparate I, impact in almost anything. I, so what we want to do is clarify the way that it's done, right. that would save taxpayers well, a lot my, of money. Also. My time is up, sir, and I may follow up with a record. Let me just say this. It's been offered out for public comment, and I want to make sure that my public comment is recorded right now. If I need to do it in writing with a black Sharpie, I'm happy to do that, but I, this is wrong. This is absolutely wrong, Mr. Secretary. This discrimination still exists in this country. We need to be affirmatively doing something about it and not making it more difficult. I'd Thank love you. to discuss it with you. Thank you. I, anytime. My door is wide open. Well, Senator you, Moran. Chairman, thank you. Uh, both the uh, HUD and um, uh, Treasury proposals suggest that there be a distinct separation between the borrowers that use FHA financing and those that use, use GSE financing. How would this be achieved, and how would, you, how would this uh, separation help home buyers? Uh, Dr. Calabria. Uh, thank you for the, the, the question, Senator. Uh, I, I think the ob objective here, which Dr. Carson talks about in his testimony, is to try to reduce that competition at the margin, which has historically driven down credit standards. We certainly saw before the crisis where the GSEs aggressively tried to grab FHA market share and did so by reducing their standards. And of course, many of those loans, unfortunately, turned out unsustainable and left homeowners in a position where they lost their homes. So again, trying to encourage responsible, sustainable homeownership is the objective. Uh, I, uh, to echo what uh, Dr. Carson again has said, traditionally FHA has focused on the first time home buyer um, low down payment uh, part of the market. And I think, uh, first of all, I'm gonna emphasize the objective here is not to have any gaps in the market, but the objective is to reduce some of that competition which has eroded standards in the past. So the, it seems to me that our goal is to um have a multiple guarantor system, uh, and that is to boost the accountability to taxpayers. Uh, I assume that you all could tell me there are things that go on at the GSEs that uh, deserve our attention in regard to accountability to taxpayers. Uh, we want financial innovation. 
Um, we want uh, greater consumer choice through competition. Is there, a, when we separate the GSE and the uh, FHA, does that uh, help achieve those goals? Who's, who's that for? Uh, whoever has the, uh, the answer that uh, is one I can understand. <laughs> <laughs> and, and succinct. Well, I, I, I can speak for the FHA uh, and, and what our goals are and what our principal uh, focus is in this reorganization is so that we can concentrate on those first time home buyers, uh, on minorities, on people who frequently don't have access to traditional credit markets. And uh, this plan actually facilitates that rather than takes away from it. Uh, one of the things it seems to me that uh, GSEs have been able to ac accumulate uh, in uh, this time frame uh, that we're in uh, is greater access to technology and information. Uh, so if we have a new system, how do we force the sharing of the benefits in data and technology that those already established in the business uh, have? Uh, well, I, I, can, I can tell you that um, the GSEs were able to uh, significantly upgrade their IT uh, performance while they were in conservatorship uh, thanks to the taxpayer. Uh, therefore, uh, what they have achieved in that area, uh, they should be willing to share. And I think uh, they recognize that, and I think Congress should recognize that. So uh, you would see an increased transparency in sharing that GSE data and other information with the industry. Could that be a precondition to release from the conservatorship? I think that's really the question for the FHFA, but I, I, would, I would agree with what you're alluding to, that these are one of the issues that we should be looking at. Um, tell me where we are in regard to capitalization and where we need to be. What, what level of capitalization do you see as necessary, maybe this is for you, Mr. Secretary, uh, at the GSEs to operate efficiently and most importantly to withstand any uh, future significant financial downturn? I think they need a lot of capital. Uh, let me just say, uh, you know, what we're looking at now, $3 billion in each is, is irresponsible in terms of the amount of capital that they have, and there's no way they could operate if it weren't for the fact that they could draw on the Treasury lines, which in essence act as a capital backstop today. So we really see two things. One, retaining earnings. That's one way we'll accumulate capital. And then two, we will have to raise third-party capital. But, uh, you know, again, if I were to give you a, a, a range of a number, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's more like $100 billion than it is uh, $6 billion. What, What's the capitalization today compared to where we were before the crisis of 2007-8? Uh, it, it's minuscule today. So we're in worse shape going into any kind of significant major economic downturn than we were when we had the catastrophic consequences. The, the, the GSEs could not operate today if it were not for the Treasury lines. Thank you. Senator Smith. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Ranking Member Brown, and thank you all very much for being here today. Um, you know, my office has been doing a whole series of meetings around housing all across Minnesota, small towns and rural areas. and big cities too, and I want to just do a, a note to Senator Rounds and Senator Tester for bringing up this issue and how it affects um, rural areas and especially tribal areas. And you know what I've heard in these meetings is that if you don't have a safe, affordable place to live, then nothing else in your life works. Your job doesn't work, your, ed your schooling doesn't work, your health doesn't work, your, your companies don't work because your employers, your employees don't have a place to live. So that's the the way that I am looking at these really complex questions about what we do about uh, the GSEs. And so I want to start with this. Dr. Calabria, you and I had a chance to talk some about this in, Ju in July when you came to visit my office. And in July, you indicated that you thought that uh, the Treasury report might be flexible enough to accommodate the GSEs operating like a utility with a regulated um, rate of return. 
And you even thought that maybe that you would be opening to considering that kind of a utility model rather than a multi-guarantor model um, in order to make sure that we've got the equity uh, in all the places and in all, for all the families that we need equity for. So my question is, after reviewing the Treasury plan, do you think that a utility model um, would work? Senator, let me, let me first say, I think under certain circumstances, a utility model could work. I think it would be helpful um, for members who want to see a utility model to start fleshing that out. What I take away when people suggest utility is they mean regulated rate of return and therefore regulated pricing. As you know, currently in conservatorship, we do regulate the pricing of the GSEs. Uh, and I certainly would welcome having such flexible, regulatory flexibility outside of conservatorship. Well, as, um, as Senator Brown said, as we've been working on this and looking at this, this idea of a utility type model has emerged as something that there seems to be a lot of consensus around. Agreed. And so I'd like to consider, I think it's important that we continue that conversation because what we're seeking here is uh, a, a way of making sure that we get at the equity that we need to in order to fulfill that dream that people in this country can own a house. Absolutely. Yep. Yes, Secretary. I, I just want to comment that as well. And we've actually had very specific conversations with the chairman about this and with the director and myself. We support working with this committee on what you may consider to be a utility model. And, and again, I would just say there are plenty of utilities where the pricing of the utility is regulated. And we do think that FHFA should maintain regulation and oversight of the pricing of the guarantee. So we look forward to working with this committee on meeting objectives that, uh, that, that go down that line. Well, let's consider, let's, I'd be interested in continuing that conversation. We didn't, um, I think that's good. Now, Secretary Mnuchin, I, I just have to take this opportunity since I have a chance to see you. I don't think that you and I have had a chance to meet before. Um, you know, I just got back from Minnesota, spent, uh, the, spent August in Minnesota, and as you probably know, in Minnesota, agriculture is really the bedrock of our, of our economy. Um, and as agriculture goes, so goes small towns and rural areas. And I talked to a lot of farm families at the State Fair and in Halleck and East Grand Forks and all, you know, all over the place. And, you know, Minnesotans, we don't like conflict. We're not as quite like my colleague from uh, Louisiana. Um, we're pretty low key, but Minnesotan, Minnesota farmers are telling me that they are devastated. That is their word. They are devastated by the president's uh, tariffs, his tariffs on China. Gary Wordich, who's head of the Minnesota Farm Bureau, says um, it has already driven some farmers off the farm, which not only hurts the farming community, but it hurts rural, small town communities. It's been devastating to rural America. So. Mr. Secretary, yesterday on Fox News, you talked about the Chinese tariff war, and you said, quote, we have not yet seen any impact on the U.S. economy. And I just don't see how you can say that. You know, in 2017, China imported a little over 19 billion in U.S. ag products. Um, and that was in 17. In 18, 9.2 billion, a 50% drop. And Minnesota farm families are like, they're being, they don't want to be told to be patient. They're afraid they're going to lose their farm. So my question is, do you really believe that this tariff war, the president's tariff war, hasn't had an effect on our economy? First, let me say, uh, I look forward to coming, spend, spending time with you, so I'll have my office reach out. Thank you. Uh, my comment was on a broad impact on a $22 trillion economy. I also went on to say, that there clearly are specific situations, some of which where we've given waivers. And I, I want to acknowledge on the, the farm area, uh, we spent a lot of time even on it, trying to get an interim agreement to have China buy agriculture. So I very much appreciate what's going on. I never thought I'd become an expert on soybeans and other agricultural products. Uh, I've been accused at times of just wanting to sell soybeans. That's not what we're trying to do. But we want to make sure that China treats our farmers fairly and doesn't retaliate against the farmers in an unfair way in the way we've been doing. And I can tell you that's top of the agenda for the conversations we're having this month. Well, I think Minnesota farmers, the soybean farmers in northwestern Minnesota have seen their sales uh, drop by 75 percent. 
They don't have any place to store the beans anymore. They feel like they are collateral damage I, in this trade I, war, and I, I, I think it's urgent that I, we... I understand that, and I can also tell you there were specific commitments made in the Oval Office from the Chinese that they did not follow through on, and that, that has been grave concern on us for U.S. farmers. Thank you. Senator McSally. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, gentlemen, for your testimony. Uh, I'm from Arizona. In, in the last housing crisis, I was serving in the military. Uh, and uh, I'll just share with you that so many of my neighbors lost their homes uh, in a middle-class neighborhood um, of hardworking families. And this crisis hit Arizona really hard. Uh, the, the, home, the home costs, the home prices dropped about 56% in the five years after 2006. In the, in the five years before that, home prices had you know, nearly doubled. Uh, what you're describing today uh, sounds even more dangerous than the conditions that we had prior to the last crisis. Um, I haven't been here that long, <laughs> thank God, but um, sorry, I shouldn't have said that, but honored to serve Arizona. Uh, the point is, as you know, as I'm in this new role looking at this, people are expecting the government to work for them. They're expecting that we had the last crisis, we had so many people lose their homes, uh, that modifications and changes would be made in order to make sure that we prevent this from happening again. But what you're describing today, uh, if we do nothing, if none of the changes you're offering or what Congress needs to do moves forward, if it's just the status quo, we're at So uh, having tried to do this once before, uh, I feel like we're at a better spot than we were then. Yeah, as opposed to the, trying to get through a crisis, the point is preventing the crisis in the first place. So it seems like we're in similar conditions. How is it that reforms haven't been made in order to prevent us being in similar conditions? That's, I mean, that's what, you know, my constituents would be hoping the government would be doing. I, I, I shared that. Frustration is, is noted tomorrow will be my will mark five months for me. Uh, I am frustrated that we are 11 years later, uh, still have Fannie Freddie conservatorship. Again, thousand to one leverage for Fannie. This is not a safe situation to be in. Um, I commit to you that we will be working as fast as we can to try to turn this ship around. So, so any other secretary? Yeah, I, I would just say, uh, you know, at uh, FHA, our substantial delinquency rates early defaults are at the lowest rate that they've been. So changes have been made. We've recognized uh, what happened before with the manipulation of uh, debt to income ratios and uh, credit scoring uh, possibilities. And here's a key factor. You know, putting people in a home that they can't afford doesn't do them any favors. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they lose the home, they lose their credit, they lose their future possibilities. That's playing into what's going on today. For instance, in the minority community, particularly in the African-American community, we have fewer homeowners today than we had before the crisis mm -hmm. because their credit was ruined. And in some of these cases, there are people who had good credit before. We're looking at that to see how we can, can, can help with that situation, but we want to make sure that we do learn from those things, and, and we have made substantial progress. Great, thanks. I want to also share that um, in my, you know, I took a tour to all 15 counties of Arizona in my first 90 days, and affordable housing, I want to, I want to associate myself with my colleagues as well, affordable housing for the workforce, uh, whether that's rental or buying, is something that is a real challenge for many communities in Arizona uh, to include rural communities. And I know this is not all just a federal issue, but this is something that is really impacting uh, the people that I represent. So I think breaking down as many barriers as we can uh, to provide better access is something that's really critical for Arizonans. So thank you. Senator Reid. Well, thank you. Uh, Director Calabria, uh, thank you for being here today along with your colleagues. We've all talked about affordable housing. In fact, uh, this is the most, I think, unanimous sort of sense of the criticality of affordable housing I've heard in this committee. There are two programs that directly aid affordable housing. That's the Capital Magnet Fund and the Housing Trust Fund. They are funded through assessments on the agencies, not through the appropriations process. Will you commit to ensure that these are fully funded and will continue forward to support affordable housing? Within the constraints of the statute, absolutely yes. Thank you very much. Now, I'd like to direct a question to all the, the panelists, three questions, and I'll start first with the Secretary of the Treasury. Uh, Secretary Mnuchin, you've done an analysis of the impact of this program, I presume. So can I just ask you, and give a categorical sense or a general sense, who will not be able to get a mortgage under your proposal? I, I don't think there's anybody who 
won't get a mortgage other than there may, there may be certain people today who shouldn't get mortgages because they really can't afford them. But affordable mortgages are what we want. So you've not identified any group or uh, group of individuals that would be disadvantaged by the proposal? The, the only thing is, and is, is the director has said he's looking at the GSEs, which is really his responsibility of there may be certain high-risk loans, okay. the GSEs that are making that they shouldn't, but that's his responsibility. I'll, and not I'll ask him. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Uh, Secretary Carson, from your analysis, do you see sure. any groups that would be left out? Yeah, uh, well, certainly there are some people who uh, probably should not be uh, mortgage holders. And uh, in, in many cases, uh, very disabled people, elderly people, people who are drug addicted, uh, uh, who are not going to be able to, to make the payments. We have other programs for individuals like that. And Dr. Clavery, your, your analysis. Well, uh, uh, Senator, I'll, I'll note it's, it's the administration's plan and, and being an independent regulator, we haven't done an analysis of the administration's plan. Okay. Uh, again, going back to kind of the analysis underlying the proposal, uh, will it cost more to get mortgages on your analysis? Have you done some data runs to show that rates will remain relatively constant? We, we, we don't think it will cost more. And, and again, on, on the first question, what I was saying is there may be people who have giant cash out mortgages today that are creating big risk to the GSEs that there shouldn't be. That's what I was implying when if there are people who won't get mortgages. But it's a supposition. It's not an analytical analysis. You don't have analysis. Uh, we would do an analytical analysis as part of this, but no, we haven't done Thank that you. part yet today. Dr. Carson, any comments on the uh, cost? Uh, we don't have any uh, analysis that dictate or that suggests that the prices will be raised. We are doing things to try to lower the prices, working with the servicers and making sure that they do the appropriate things, particularly before foreclosures. And, uh, Senator, if I could offer some, yes, some, some, please. some commentary. Uh, I think it's important to keep in mind the plan suggests, and, and I have called for as well, increased competition. Uh, again, it's been a few years since I was in grad school, but the economics I learned is that competitive markets provide lower cost and more access than monopolies and duopolies. So it's just hard for me to believe that bringing competition into this market will result in anything but lower prices. And again, I think there's a strong amount of evidence of that. Again, we look at other sectors across the economy. Uh, again, there's pretty good evidence for that. Well, uh, again, I, I conceptually, you make a point. If you get that evidence in an analytical fashion, we'd love to have it. I certainly would. Thank you. And then. Uh, Another question, how about community banks and credit unions? Will they fare better or worse under this arrangement, in your view, or your analysis? We would absolutely make sure that they did not fare worse. We want them to be treated fairly, and that's a very important part of any any future plan. Uh, Dr. Carson? Uh, they're they're absolutely key. Uh, we've been working with them. And uh, their ability, particularly to provide uh, education to people about uh, housing financial managers is essential. And Dr. Clary. Uh, Senator, it was mentioned earlier the uh, control over pricing, such as the utility model. One of the things we've done in conservatorship is eliminate the volume discounts that Fannie and Freddie gave to large lenders. Uh, as you know, pre-crisis, Countrywide paid a lower price than community banks. Mm -hmm. Fannie and Freddie pre-crisis drove consolidation in the origination side. Uh, I think it's important post-conservatorship for me to have the authority to limit uh, Fannie and Freddie's ability to drive consolidation. Okay. Uh, if I can just for a moment, uh, there's been a lot of discussion of the lack of capitalization of uh, Fannie and Freddie and the fact they just rely upon the Treasury to survive. It's interesting, though, because since, uh, and I was here, and Senator Crape was here, uh, since this crisis began, I think we've invested $191 billion in Fannie and Freddie, and the Treasury has received about uh, $400 million, I believe, excuse me, uh, $300 billion in terms of dividends you've taken out. So couldn't you correct the this capital discrepancy by just relenting on some of the dividends you're taking out? The taxpayers 
should be and have been compensated for the risk that they've had historically and the risk they have going forward. So had the taxpayers put the money in the stock market, they would have earned multiples of this. So the answer is this isn't just about if, if we took away tomorrow, if we said we got our money back, we'll just rip up our guarantees, these entities couldn't exist. So as long as taxpayers are at risk, we expect the taxpayers to be compensated. But just a final point, isn't your model going forward to allow these individuals, these entities, to keep their capital, basically keep their dividends? Two, two, two different things. So from a cash flow and a capital standpoint, yes, our intent is they will keep the cash and will increase their capitalization. What we are negotiating with the director right now is in return for that, we do expect that the taxpayers are compensated. One way may be to increase our liquidated preference, maybe commitment fees, but that, that's what we're discussing now. Thank you, Mr. Trish. Senator Cortez Mastel. Thank you. First of all, let me just uh, thank um, Chairman and Ranking Member. Uh, affordable housing in this discussion is key. Uh, it is something we have been talking about, but it is a, a major issue that we need to address in this country. In Nevada, it is outside of the cost of health care, the number one issue. So I appreciate, gentlemen, you being here. But let me let me just kind of also uh, kind of introduce you to Nevada, uh, and because come, some of the discussion is not pertinent to what I'm uh, hearing the, in the impact in Nevada when it comes to affordable housing. I've had roundtable discussions on this issue for the last two years in Nevada in our urban and rural areas. If you don't know anything about Nevada, know of the 17 counties, 15 are rural. Um, and and I, I can tell you right now, rent control is not causing the affordable housing crisis in Nevada. In fact, Nevada does not have a, uh, 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 any type of laws that mandate type of rent control. And it's my understanding there's actually only five states that have rent control. Um, I'd also like to, to point out that, yes, streamlining state and local permitting and improving local zoning will help, but it will not solve the problem. And it is not the main impact to the affordable housing issue in our state. I can promise you this, around those affordable housing roundtables that I've had, local and state government have been at the table with our private sector, uh, as well as so many other people, and some of the folks that work for you as well. So please know that. I am looking for answers, and I think we can uh, come together to address this issue um, if we work together. But let me let me start, Secretary uh, Carson, with you. I'm curious, does HUD support the continuation of the Housing Trust Fund? Uh, the, the purpose of the Housing Trust Fund, uh, we certainly support that. You do support it. The, so you would you would support keeping good. keeping the Housing Trust Fund intact the way it is now? Uh, I don't know if I... Uh, wouldn't be uh, happy with some changes to it, but what the, type of changes would you make? Well, you know, we we really want to take a more comprehensive look when it comes to how do we get people uh, into affordable housing situations. Uh, that includes everybody in our society, and I'd like you know to be able to provide a little more flexibility. Uh, not only for the agency, but for uh, localities. I'm not sure what that means, but let me ask you this. Right now, um, it, it, to the changes you're making, how will it affect the $3 million or more that all states receive every year to address acute housing needs for extremely low-income families? Well, we may, have, we may have better solutions for extremely low housing uh, low-income people. Do you have you know, those yet? I, I, or, I or is that something you're looking to work with Congress on those solutions? Of course we want to work with Congress on those solutions, but I just want to make it clear that traditionally just throwing money at the problem has not solved it. This has been going on for several decades, and we want to look at some of the more deeper issues that cause their problems and address those. Okay, I, I absolutely agree that this needs to be addressed, but we've, we've got to have substance. We, we have to have details, and, we, and, we'll uh, and that's what we're looking for. Yes, Secretary Mnuchin. What, what I was going to comment on is one thing that's clear today is there is bipartisan support on the issue of affordable housing. There may be differences in views in how we can get there. I, I just want to be clear in the report, it may be there should be more money put for affordable housing. So when we talk about the housing trust funds, I'd say if there were a more efficient and accountable mechanism and Congress wanted to put more money for affordable housing, that's something the administration would be very much open to working with this committee on. So right. This, and I agree there's uh, bipartisan the report support. The does which, not imply less money 
for affordable housing. That's what I wanted to make clear. Thank you. What's your definition of affordable housing? How do you define it? It, it depends on the market. What's affordable in one market is not affordable in a different market. And I think there's both affordable housing, both to own as well as to rent. Right, but if you are setting parameters about how the funding is going to go towards affordable housing, how do you know where to send it if you don't define it first? Well, we'd have to work with this committee. So, I mean, so you haven't defined it yet? Well, they're, they're traditional. Uh, What's the traditional? Traditional is you should spend less than 30% of your household income on housing. And if you spend more than 50%, then that's severely distressed. Okay, and so that is a parameter that you're looking at when you're deciding how you're going to focus on the needs of those that fall within the affordable housing definition that you just defined, is that correct? I, I think that's generally acceptable. Is there, is, are there any other uh, identifiers to for affordable housing? And I'll open that up for all the panel, Doctor, or excuse me, director. Well, we certainly have a number of different formulas. I mean, the CDBG has a different formula. Personally, I would probably allocate it across states based on poverty. Uh, obviously, on one extreme, the low-income housing tax credit is done on a per capita basis. Uh, that, to me, is not, probably not well targeted. So again, we have a number of formulas uh, across states. This is certainly, certainly the committee has dealt with on multiple occasions. Okay, let, let, me, let me change, uh, I've just got a few minutes. Manufactured, manufactured housing is very important to Nevada and particularly our rural communities. So uh, um, Secretary Carson, let me ask you this. HUD includes manufactured housing in your proposal without any specifics. What protections for manufactured housing home buyers will you ensure remain in any change policy? Uh, uh, well, thank you for bringing that up because manufactured housing has changed dramatically and almost 10% of single families are in manufactured housing. People think about trailers and double whites. We're talking about tremendous technological progress that has been made in that area. And what remains really is removal of a lot of the regulations. I know you don't think that regulations are everything, but they have severely impeded the ability to utilize this very excellent solution. And that's regulations at the federal level, regulations at local, the state and local? State and local okay. levels. Absolutely. So if the state and local level they're willing to address those issues in which they're working on in my state, um, what to what extent are you looking at if having an impact on manufactured housing as it comes to federal role? Well, uh, you know, HUD obviously is the regulator of uh, the rules regarding manufactured housing. And uh, we have now taken manufactured housing and made it a separate entity uh, with a, a DAS uh, designation. So uh, we have paid a lot of attention to this. This is an area where I think we can solve a lot of the problem. Well, let me ask you this. Can you agree to preserve the protections for manufactured housing as we move through this process of, of looking at various changes? Uh, we will preserve them and expand on them as necessary. Thank you. I notice my time is up. Thank you. Senator Van Hollen. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank all of you for being here. Secretary Carson, I want to follow up on some of the questions Senator Jones uh, asked uh, with respect to the proposed rule that HUD put forward in August that would gut the ability of people who are victims of housing discrimination to prove that discrimination using a disparate impact analysis. Uh, in your response to Senator Jones, you said uh, that the purpose of this rule was, qu was quote, to bring the rule in al alignment with the Supreme Court decision, unquote. Is that your testimony? That's correct. So I I'm confused, Mr. Secretary, because I, I have in my hand here an April 27 20 2017 filing where you're the defendant in the case, HUD's being sued uh, in the U.S. District Court for the Northern District of Illinois Eastern Division, and the plaintiff is alleging that the existing rule, 213, uh, is not in compliance with the Supreme Court decision. And in this pleading, you took the opposite position. I quote from your own brief here, stating, quote, the Supreme Court's holding in inclusive communities is entirely consistent with the rule's reaffirmation of HUD's longstanding interpretation that the FHA authorizes disparate impact claims, unquote. So which is it, Mr. Secretary? I mean, you've taken the position in a court filing that Rule 2013, as is, is consistent 
with the Supreme Court case, and your testimony today is just the opposite. No, it is not. Uh, we uphold the principles of disparate impact, and, and in fact, as I testified earlier today, we've used that uh, in a recent uh, complaint against Mr. Secretary, let me just ask you this. Is, is, do you, is your testimony today remain, though, that Rule 213 is consistent with the Supreme Court's holding in inclusive communities, which is the position that you took in this filing in April 2017. Is your position today on that question the same as it was in 2017? My position? Yes or no? I mean, this is a pretty simple question. My position, I, I don't do yes or no. Um, but my position is that we want to be consistent with the ideal of the Supreme Court, which is not to have this be so overly burdened that we drag discrimination into virtually but, every but case. But, Mr. Secretary, you took the position in this filing that the existing rule complied with the Supreme Court decision in inclusive communities. Now, as I understand what you're saying, is you're just using that decision as a pretext to rewrite the rule to make it much harder to file a discrimination claim. Is that what you're saying today? No, what I'm saying is well, that- Well, then why are you rewriting the rule that you said was consistent with the earlier, with the Supreme Court decision? If your purpose was, as you testified earlier today, Look, to bring the rule in alignment with the Supreme Court decision. What I'd like to do is actually talk about solutions to problems. Mr. Secretary, really, I, you, you say you don't answer yes or no questions, but this is a pretty simple question. You took a position, you as Secretary, took a position in this court filing in 2017 that said the existing rule, Rule 213, is compliant is consistent with the Supreme Court decision in inclusive communities. Yes. So I was surprised earlier today to hear you say that the reason for your new proposed rule, which you just filed in 2013, was because you wanted to bring it in compliance with the Supreme Court decision, which you earlier stated it was already, the previous rule is compliant with. So my question is, which is it? There are aspects of the rule that can be reinterpreted in many different ways, and it depends on which circumstance you're talking about. You know that. Well, Mr. Secretary, uh, you're clearly in this latest proposed rule going way beyond what the Supreme Court required in terms of proving discrimination. In fact, you took the opposite position in 2017. And so it does We're not appear. going. Oh, so, so if I can show you a proposed rule change that is consistent with the Supreme Court decision, but does not make it as difficult to file a discrimination case, would you accept that change as part of your new rule? What I would say is let's talk about what makes sense and what's logical and what helps us to solve the problem. Yeah, well, what we're trying to do is <laughs> allow people to prove discrimination where it exists. And we're and happy to do that. the Supreme Court has upheld the disparate analysis impact because they understand that discrimination can be subtle. People don't jump up and say, hey, I'm denying you uh, this loan because of your race. Senator, and I would so that's the whole purpose of this, Mr. Secretary. You took a position in support of the earlier rule in 2017. You appear to have flipped on it uh, today. I hope we can work together during this comment period to get to, to the bottom of this. I'd be happy to work together with you, and I would ask you to look at our record in pursuing cases against people who've discriminated against protected classes. But, but you, you brought some of those cases under the, under the existing rule, 213, some, and now you're changing that some rule. Some of the or cases you're have been brought that rule. with so disparate let, impact, and I yeah, do not disagree right. with disparate impact. It's the way that you interpret disparate impact that's okay. important. Well, let's interpret it in a way that still allows people to be able to bring discrimination cases where it exists. And they Thank you. still can, absolutely. Thank you. That concludes our questioning. And before we conclude the hearing, Senator Brown has a, a couple, couple of brief comments. I was um, found, I followed with interest Senator Cotton's comments about removing regulatory barriers to fair and affordable housing like, like zoning rules. Um, I, was, I was pleasantly surprised because several years ago he co-sponsored an appropriations amendment to end HUD's affirmatively furthering fair housing rule because he said it would give HUD too much say in local zoning. Um, that amendment failed. Secretary Carson has recently suspended that rule when his watch, AFFH, would help communities identify and remove those barriers. So I will ask um, later, ask Senator Cotton to join me in asking you, Secretary Carson, 
uh, to reinstate that rule. The other comment, uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make is uh, Secretary Mnuchin and Director Clabria, thanks for your comments on a utility model. I look forward to working with you on this and really figuring out how we can flesh out details. Um, I'll, I will ask the staff of staffs of both of you to provide technical assistance on a utility model with a regulated rate of return. So um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, thank you. That does conclude the hearing. Uh, for senators wishing to submit questions for the record, those questions are due in one week on Tuesday, September 17th. As for the witnesses, we ask, as always, that you respond to those questions as promptly as you can. Again, we want to thank all of you for being here today and look forward to our, our continuing work together on this important topic. This hearing is adjourned. Thank you.